Scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew 22, starting at verse 34. Hearing all that Jesus had had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, Love your Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the pro prophets hang on these two commands. While the Pharisees were gathering together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Who, whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David is speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord. For, he, for it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can it be his son? No one would say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Here in the reading of God's holy word. So our scripture for today is one that I'm sure you are all familiar with. Uh, indeed, it is probably one of the three most quoted parts of the New Testament. Um, in my estimation, the other two are John 3.16, uh, the succinct telling of how salvation can be attained, uh, and the other is Matthew 28.19-20, which is the Great Commission, uh, telling us of our duty to go and make disciples of all the nations. So our scripture for today is found in Matthew chapter 22, uh, and it is the oft-quoted, love God and love your neighbors as yourself, right? Well, we see in this part of scripture, those rascals, the Pharisees, are once again coming to Jesus with a question. Now, we talked about last week how they, they just kept trying to trick Jesus, right, over and over again. So this week, they're not sending uh, their disciples like they did last week to test him. No, this week, they're sending in the big guns, right? They're sending their best and their brightest. They're sending a lawyer who, much like in our day today, is someone that was an expert in the law. Now, where our, law, our lawyers are experts in our modern law in the United States, their lawyer would have been someone who was an expert in Old Testament law. The difference uh, be, between just a regular Pharisee and a lawyer Pharisee is that a regular Pharisee would have studied the law, but also the prophets and the things that they had to say, whereas a Pharisee lawyer would have focused only on the law uh, that was found in the Old Testament. So this lawyer comes forward to ask Jesus a question. He says, Lord, what is the greatest commandment? Well, that's how we usually read that scripture, right? We, we find ourselves falling into our old ideas of, oh, the Pharisees are here trying to trick Jesus. They're sending out someone to try and trick him. But in this case, it actually doesn't seem to be what's happening here. You see, in the scriptures just before ours, Jesus had been talking to the Sadducees, our other group of scholars we often talk about. Uh, and it seems that the lawyer had been sitting and listening to what Jesus had been saying. And this lawyer was actually asking a question that he wanted to hear the answer to. Not out of trying to trick, but out of wanting to learn. Um, we get a parallel telling of this story in Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And what we see in Mark's telling of this story is a bit more interaction between Jesus and this lawyer. See, in the description that Mark gives us, the lawyer asks his question, Jesus answers it the same, 
telling him the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But in Mark, the lawyer responds to what Jesus has said by saying this, Well said, teacher. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus responds to the lawyer saying, you are not far from the kingdom of God. See, this was not just our usual Pharisee interaction, right? This was not just coming forward to try and trick. This is someone who did want to learn. But it's interesting that Jesus chose to answer in the way that he did, not because it's such great information. It is, right? It is an amazing thing that he says here. Love God, love people. Uh, it's an easy enough message for us to understand and to base all other thought upon. But he chose to answer in this manner because, of course, Jesus knew the scriptures. See, what he took in this answer was he took part of Exodus and he took part of Leviticus and he put them together and answered this lawyer who was an expert in Old Testament law in a way that he would understand clearly and in a way that he could not refute. Well, we could look at that response that Jesus gave and we could say, you know, he really gave a safe answer there. He knew that what he was saying couldn't be argued with. He knew that it was part of the law. He knew that this lawyer would know that it was part of the law. But it wasn't about giving safe answers. Jesus was not about giving safe answers. It was about trying to teach. You know, we have this idea in our world today that if we want to grab someone's attention, we almost have to shock them, right? It's not enough to just simply try to get their attention in a normal way. We have to do something that's shocking. Um, you know, I think if you watch uh, any television or movies or listen to uh, music, you can agree that there is stuff out there that serves no other purpose than to simply shock people so that they will talk about it, right? Uh, you know, if you watch the news every night, you know that the first news story that it comes on every night is usually something that is very brutal and violent. Uh, they do that so people stay tuned into the news for the rest of the cast. You're probably, maybe you've heard this before, maybe not. Uh, in the news business, they like to say, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. Meaning if it's violent, then it's going first. So it turns out, though, that you don't need to shock people all the time. You don't have to do something outrageous to, gather, to get their attention. See, like Jesus, we could simply tell others the truth. We could tell others the truth about who Jesus is and watch how that can get their attention and transform their lives. Now, last week when we talked about how Jesus spent his time teaching people, uh, even when they were trying to trick him, as they were last week, when they were trying to trick him into saying something that would get him into trouble, I asked a question of you and we kind of glazed over it and passed and went forward. And the question was this, what would you do if you were in that situation? What would you do if you found yourself in a spot where you could speak the truth and get into trouble? What is it that you would do? So when we come face, face to face with situations like this in our life, what are we to do? Well, the easy answer is to just say, well, we'll speak the truth. Right? That's the easy answer. It's a very easy answer in a hypothetical situation. Right? There's no pressure when you're answering it hypothetically. The real truth is that it is much harder to speak the truth in situations where we know there will be consequences. Now, I'm guessing that none of you ever got in trouble when you were younger, right? That's my estimation of all of you. You've never gotten in trouble when you were younger. I know that you have always been fine, upstanding people and that your parents never had to pry the truth out of you, right? You always were forthcoming right away with the truth. 
I, I'm enjoying your honesty this morning. <laughs> that no one's, yeah, that's right. Um, well, I wasn't a bad kid uh, per se, but there were times growing up where I did something wrong. And yes, my parents did kind of have to wring the truth out of me at times. But they did always tell me this. They said if I did something wrong and I told the truth, my punishment would be less. But if I lied and they found out about me lying, then my punishment would be much worse. So when I was around four years old, uh, my dad was taking a nap on the couch. And while he was sleeping, my cousin Cody and I uh, snuck up beside him and we stuck a raisin into his ear. And much to our surprise, he didn't wake up. And a day or two later, he noticed he was having trouble hearing while he was at work and he felt like something was stuck in his ear and he shook his head and lo and behold, a raisin fell out. Now cut forward to my mom having found this out and she is questioning me on how did a raisin get in your father's ear? Eric, did you put a raisin in your dad's ear? And my response was, no, mom, I would never do anything like that. Well, then how did a raisin get in your dad's ear? Well, I didn't do it, mom, but Cody did. <laughs> See, that was a half truth there, right? Now, I don't remember what the punishment was for that or if there was even a punishment for it, because quite honestly, it's turned into a very funny story in our family. So um, that's where my memory ends of that. But I tell you to illustrate the story that we do struggle to tell the truth when we know there'll be trouble because of it. But we do know that we do have a responsibility to tell the truth. And we especially have a responsibility to tell the truth about Jesus. See, when we find ourselves in a situation where we need to tell the truth about Jesus and who he is, sometimes we struggle to say what we know or what we feel to be true. We get a case of the what ifs is what I like to call it, a case of the what ifs. What if this person gets offended by what I say? What if this person doesn't like me anymore when they find out I'm a Christian? What if this person has had a bad experience in the church before, and by me talking about Jesus, it brings up bad memories for them? Well, the truth in life is that you can what if yourself till you're blue in the face. There is always a what if in any situation if you look hard enough. I'm really good at finding what if situations in my mind. It's one of the uh, personality traits of mine that I dislike the most. I tend to think and think and think and think and think, what if, what if, what if, what if. Turns out none of those things ever happen, right? But my question for you is this. Instead of thinking about what if this goes wrong, think of it this way. What if this is the only time that this person will ever hear the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that salvation can only be found in him? What if this is the only time in their life when they are open to hearing that message? See, that is the question that we should be asking ourselves when we find ourselves in those situations. See, we always have a choice in this world. We have a choice whenever we come face to face with the situation of telling people the truth about Jesus. And in that choice, I believe we can follow one of two things. We can follow fear, or we can follow faith. See, fear is going to tell you all about those what-ifs. It's going to tell you that you're not good enough to share the gospel of Jesus with someone else. It's going to tell you that you don't love your God and that you don't love your neighbor enough, so how could you ever tell someone else about Jesus? So fear is a powerful tool that is used to stop us from doing what it is God has called us to do. So we can choose fear or we can choose faith. And faith says, you know what? I trust God is going to use my words in the way that he needs to in this person's life. Faith says, I know I'm not perfect. 
but I'm doing my best to love God and to love my neighbor. Faith says that no matter what the consequences are, I will speak the truth and know that God will guide me through whatever I may face on the other side. Now, you might be thinking to yourself this morning, thanks, Pastor. I needed to hear I can say whatever I want to to anyone that I meet and then call it faith. Oh, I have been waiting for the green light to go out and tell everyone how they are wrong about all that they are doing, that they are such big sinners, that I'm glad that you finally have given us the go-ahead to do so. Well, that is not what I said to you this morning. And do not take it that way. I said you can tell people the truth about Jesus and do so in faith. So if we are truly loving God and our neighbor, then you are going to tell them about Jesus so that they can see for themselves how their lives can change. You are going to tell them about Jesus because you care about them and their eternal souls. And you're going to tell them about Jesus because you love Jesus and you know that only he can transform their lives. You see, we're not telling people the truth about Jesus uh, in order to rub their noses in their sin. We are not doing so so that we can feel superior to them. We are going to be a people that tell the truth about Jesus because we love Jesus and because we love our neighbors. See, that is what I believe he has called all of us to do. So let us do our best to love God and love our neighbors and be unafraid in telling others the truth that will indeed set them free. My challenge for you this week is this. Tell one person this week about Jesus, having faith that he will take it from there. Amen.